Good morning or afternoon, wherever you may be in the country or the world. Um, I want to welcome all of you to another NBO Presents. I am Pam Morton, Executive Director of the National Basketry Organization. We're happy and excited to have you join us today for our replaying of Pat Hickman's closing lecture, Baskets Holding, from our, our online conference virtually woven 2022 crossing boundaries that took place this past July. There are two reasons for this rebroadcast. First, Pat wanted her lecture to be shared as much as possible. It's so important to the field of basketry. Second, we have had countless requests about how people could watch it, whether or not they were able to attend virtually woven. Presenting this program again, we have the opportunity to also include a question and answer period at the end of the recording. Please put your questions in the Q&A section at the bottom right of your screen and we'll try to answer as many of them as possible. As you can imagine, these webinars have a financial impact on NBO. I'm putting a donation link in the Q&A section, or you can go to nationalbasketry.org to the donate tab. We appreciate your donation of any amount. And with that, Pat and I are going to begin. So Pat, welcome to another NBO Presents. Thank you, Pam. Thank you for the introduction and for this opportunity to have a rerun of what I said in the summer. Uh, I really appreciate the chance to have this available again and possibly in the future for people who aren't able to attend today. So thank you, NBO and, and Pam. It's, it's so weird still that here I am at my desk and you are wherever you are. <laughs> I appreciate this format but I would so much rather be where you are or be somewhere together in a physical space where after the talk, we could really just sit and talk about whatever it is that you have questions about. So please do know that I welcome questions at the end. So let's show the, show the talk, Pam. All right, I'm going to screen share and this, Recording is a little over 37 minutes, so here we go. What an extraordinary two days we've had with some remarkable presentations. I'm honored to be part of this event. Thank you, NBO, for the invitation to close this virtual 2022 conference. It's given me time to reflect on what can I say? What can I say in my work that matters? What can Basket say? Baskets Holding is an open invitation to imagine with me what is being held, what can be held? What can baskets say? I came across this image of the Langeberger Company building, a beloved seven-story woven market basket, an architectural wonder in Newark, Ohio. People apparently loved being in the basket. The company had created handmade, well-crafted baskets. This big basket opened in 1997. It has two enormous handles, which were heated during winter to thaw the ice and had a glass roof that light could come through. In my mind, architects and the art, the skill of building baskets go together. At NBO's last in-person conference in Bowling Green, Kentucky, I was on the tour led by Scott Gilbert. One memorable stop for me was the Family Medical Clinic in Munfordville in Hart County. Dr. Jim Middleton in the waiting rooms of his clinic displays some of his impressive collection of prize-winning baskets in his county, 
the ones he's collected over the past 50 years. What was conveyed to me through the baskets and the hanging quilts was comfort and familiarity, a welcoming space for waiting patients. I came home wishing baskets might be in my doctor's office in New York. As the new Whitney Museum in New York City was in the planning stages to be built in 2015, Richard Archwager was commissioned to design the elevators, a space for art. And as the core of the museum, he created an art basket, an elevator as basket, knowing he wanted a sense of the familiar, a basket for people carrying people within it. The interior of the elevator is of engraved panels of stainless steel, an image of woven basketry structure to be touched and part of everyday experience in that museum. Here's an image of the critical beginning of this elevator basket, the start, what I call the belly button. There is a sense of wonder being inside a big basket, somewhat like going up and down in a hot air balloon. A bamboo theater in China is an outdoor basket-like enclosure defining the space within. Climbing ladders serve as skeletal structure reaching upward like basketry spokes in this sculpture by Australian artist Paul Caporn. For me, in this work, he raises questions of our time. Where are we precariously going? In 1985, in the 12th biennial in Lausanne, when the theme was textiles and sculpture, I was most impressed with these huge classical vessels by Katsuhiro Fujimura, giant baskets made of corrugated cardboard. Thin slices of cardboard were cut, turned sideways and adhered, stacked so light could pass through the openings of the corrugation, creating a basket for holding air and light and ideas. As carefully fitted sections were put in place, they were joined, tied together with plastic coated wire. The wire then snipped off as the vessel walls were secured. Those of us installing near Fujimura marveled as we watched these vessels being built and becoming. I remember Catherine Westfall used to say that baskets included the broadest range of possibilities. Bags and boxes, even homes, could be thought of as upside down baskets. We are living in a time of refugee crisis. This is an old photograph, an image of one Syrian refugee camp. It shows supposedly temporary shelters, but alas, not so temporary for many displaced families scrambling to have a life, desperate to live. It's impossible not to think about what people could grab and carry with them as they are forced to leave their homes. Tim O'Brien, The Things They Carried, written after Vietnam, prompted these humble, pared down bundles I made, reflecting on war, on memory, on what matters. I was so very fortunate to be a graduate student of Ed Rosbach at the University of California, Berkeley. His book, Baskets as Textile Art, published in 1974, defined and shaped our field, gave language to it. Here is a shrine he made in 1984, reacting to news and images he saw then of the Civil War in El Salvador expressing his deep sadness at the destruction he vicariously witnessed. Lillian Elliott's Goya in 1979 referenced the Spanish artist and the upheavals he captured in his work. 
her sculptural basket was painted black to unify it and speak of the horrors of war. She was so aware of art history and a larger context in time and connections to other artists, painters, sculptors. She felt she stopped seeing if she wasn't drawing. Goya was like calligraphy with a graphic impact, black against white. Her ideas were no different from ideas addressed by all visual artists, whatever their medium. She wanted her work to have something to do with today's world, with what has touched human life. This work transcends the medium, brought fiber to art and art to fiber. Here is Rosbach's flag basket, red, white, and blue. He was not especially patriotic. Rosbach was not marching in the streets, but what he did seemed revolutionary using materials and ways of working never before imagined by basket makers. He got a fresh look with bark cloth and flat reed, materials purchased from the caning shop in Berkeley. Staples were used here as his way of holding pieces together, direct, not labor intensive. A small work of mine entitled Cry, using materials from my garden, made with the roots of a dead rose bush, encased in skin membrane, thorns protruding above. A small, torn July 4th flag expresses loss for me, as I fear for my country. I created allegiance after the shock of 9-11, it's made of materials from nature in Hawaii, where I was living, patched palm sheets, folded like a flag, wondering what we could all share allegiance to. Rossback's plated image of a gun woven years ago seems timely and timeless as we daily experience the horror of senseless gun violence and mass shootings. At this year's Whitney Biennial, First Nation Anishinaabe artist Rebecca Belmore's sculpture, Fire, created in 2021, is of a sleeping bag cast in clay surrounded by empty bullet casings. This work with its hollow core is a powerful critique, a loud cry about the genocide and violence against indigenous people, especially women. And thorns, Lillian Elliott and I once overheard someone say not nice about some of our collaborative work, which we took as a compliment that discomfort was conveyed. Here's the detail. Unifying whitewashed over the materials doesn't hide the potential pain and scale of the oversized sawtoothed prickly rose thorns. Lorraine Connolly Northey is an Australian Aboriginal artist with both Western and Indigenous heritage. We saw more of her work yesterday in the lecture by Lisa Jane DeSales on new directions in Australian basketry. I respond to her using industrial materials, included, including a barbed wire handle with the baggage that material carries in this traditional, untraditional dilly bag. About her glass work, 41 Hearts, Candace Pratt says, it helps me speak to the systemic racism in our country. It is a tribute to Amadou Diallo, an unarmed Ghanaian immigrant who was shot at 41 times and killed by four New York Police Department officers in 1999. The vessel base and hearts are dichroic red glass and the spokes are black glass. The weft is iridescent thread woven in a simple pattern. 
As an African-American, Hugh Hayden felt pressure and sport cultural expectation to be an athlete playing basketball. He instead trained as an architect, an artist, here making a statement with thorns embedded into this woven form, reminiscent of the peacock throne chair backing with homage to the 1967 portrait of Huey P. Newton as the Black Panther's founder. And in this piece, Daddy says, he's woven maple veneer, filling the basket with eggshells. Here are his cherry bark covered Zelig for 2021 Air Force Ones. Dietrich Bracken's woven work carries imagery that depicts racial injustice and his identity as the queer black man living in America. Here in a new series he calls Ark of Bulrushes, he's built a body boat basket that holds him. He wants to float on the Mississippi River and be in waters in the South where his ancestors were enslaved. His work always reflects his black body in form or narrative. Bulgarian artist Rumen Dimitrov captures energy and a sense of strong wind blowing in this air-filled sculpture of his in the environment. Humbleweed draws on place and influences from my past where I grew up on the plains of Colorado. A detail shows skin membrane laid over the knotted netted grid, which picks up the pattern of the rusty wire. Gut patches remain visible in layers below. A tumbleweed collects evermore in its growing life as it rolls across the prairie. Joanne Siegel Brantford's Still Again, created in 1992, is made of rattan dyed in a technique called spraying. Joanne tried to ignore her de degenerating heart condition. She made baskets confronting the question of whether her heart would hold up to her demands. The spraying form is held together by an almost invisible thread. A viewer feels the tension and the reality of her lack of time. She said, I hope I will have the strength to do baskets. I think I will. She had tremendous determined life force. In Nuzzle, Joanne expressed ideas of closeness, of touch. Exploring a form adds an idea, pushing it as far as she could. Here is an open work basket by Norma Minkowitz. The impression of the bird's beak against the basket wall becomes the focus for me of this birdcage, an awareness of the struggle inside and push to be free. Romani, in 1985, a collaborative sculptural work of mixed materials, approximately five feet by eight feet wide by six and a half feet deep, was a stretch for us. Here, Lillian Elliott is having a trial run, putting this large basket together before we shipped it to Switzerland. Because of working in this scale after Lausanne, Lillian pared down the structures she built, simplifying the complexity of them in our collaborative work, using larger elements. And I knew by then that I could cover big spaces. It felt like the world with gut, with sausage casings. Here's our collaborative basket installed as part of the 12th biennial in Lausanne, the year the theme was textiles as sculpture. Drawn form by Lillian, a fluid three-dimensional drawing made of linear elements uses the fewest lines possible to encircle space and define volume. 
made in 1984 using rattan, wax linen, and acrylic paint. This is so pared down. She wanted to feel volume. She had studied ceramics at Cranbrook, but felt her pots were always heavy. Her best baskets were not heavy, and she loved that airiness while getting the sense of volume she wanted. Ed Rosbach's basket of structure and paper skin holds an image of another basket, one basket holding another. And one more basket by Ed Rosbach showing connections in his own individual technique, one material reaching out to hold or embrace another, kept firmly in place with staples. This is a swing where Dorothy Gill Barnes sat outside her studio in Ohio. After she died, I had the privilege of being there, imagining this gentle container holding her, her body like a basket. In Dorothy's sculptural work, she used materials to join one part to another, firmly holding on and holding together. Dorothy Gilbarnes combined unlikely materials and they worked together as a unified whole. Dorothy once told me how this piece grew. She had jury duty, which went on and on. And as she served, she twined, resolving the top of this basket. Baskets hold stories. Shan Goshorn, a member of the Eastern Band of Cherokee, created a powerful body of work in her short life, 1957 to 2018. These 14 baskets are entitled Resisting the Mission, Filling the Silence, made the year before she died. The U.S. government attempted to solve, quote, the Indian problem, unquote by creating military-inspired Indian boarding schools to assimilate Native children. The intention was to eradicate Native culture in one generation. We continue belatedly to learn about these schools in both Canada and the U.S. At the school in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, where some of Goshorn's family were placed, the speaking of tribal language was forbidden. There was a silencing of voices. The goal was to integrate Native children into mainstream white society. Goshorn took archival historic photographs, images on one side of each basket of the children who had been forcibly removed from the only family and culture they knew, showing when they arrived at the school, and then images of how they appeared with their haircut and dressed according to this horrific social experiment, powerfully illustrating this outrageous, ugly story of American history. These are Cherokee style single weave baskets with family stories written on the paper before it was cut into splints and woven. The need to overcome the silence of what happened at these schools remains urgent in North America despite the Pope's recent apology in Canada. Our lands are not lines on paper was woven of arches, watercolor paper splints with archival ink and acrylic. Goshorn's work speaks to differences between settler and indigenous conceptions of land. She said, we used natural landmarks to establish boundaries settlers brought new ways of recording land and marking ownership the traditional zigzag design of this basket is known as both the mountain and river design cherokee interpretation of place goshorn wove together a historical settler map and photograph of the great smoky mountains both of which depict cherokee lands this basket is in the collection of the yale art gallery here, the artist has used dates, documents, and names of broken treaties on the paper.
her strips she weaves. A basket by the late Jackie Abrams and her collaborator, Deidre Shearer, remembers elders and a previous generation. A bag made by Zipporo Nipsuk uses the material of Arctic eider duck feet. The presence of the whole bird foot, skin with claws, conveys meaning so very close to life. Before her untimely death, basket maker Fran Reed, a non native artist who lived in Alaska for years, used local salmon skin as one of her art materials from the animal world. She incorporated the whole skin, including fins. Materials, as was so eloquently expressed in the panel yesterday, hold power and meaning and life. Jan Hopkins' basket, emerging from darkness, made in 2019, consists of halibut fish skin, yellow cedar bark, and weathered hydrangea petals, all stitched with wax linen. This work has just been shown at the Bainbridge Island Museum of Art, part of her current series entitled Americans Incarcerated, A Family's Story of Social Injustice. This work is inspired by Jan's desire to learn more about her cultural identity. As a child of interned Japanese Americans, she grew up with little knowledge of her heritage or what her family endured after they were evicted from the West Coast in 1942. This body of work speaks of perseverance, resilience, strength, and heartbreak all at once, portraying the range of fear, racism, alienation, and loss experienced through this tragic chapter in American history. Kay Sakamachi and her glowing leaf bowls, baskets, seemingly hold light. Peggy Wiedemann created neighbors with vintage door locks, some with keys, basketry joined and linked together. At this time in our country of separation and divisiveness, this visually speaks to me of trust and sharing. Hopi artist Eva Onyestova has combined two kinds of different traditional Hopi baskets in her throw baskets. She has tightly coiled the belly button as the start of the basket and plated around that center creating, with permission, a newly evolved, changed Hopi basket. She sees this approach to traditional art as an expression of a tight community with a strong foundation, tying people together, combining different ways. She says she is doing this for the future, for Hopi children and their life, very connected with the land. Teresa Secord, a Penobscot artist, wove a basket around an old tourist postcard as the base, claiming it as hers at the center of what she had to say. Here's a detail of a basket by Mi'kmaq and Onondaga artist Gail Tremblay, whom we've heard directly from yesterday about her own work. She creates exciting conceptual baskets with traditional curling ribbon stitch using new materials. She takes old Hollywood film strips with images which misrepresented Native Americans by non-Native filmmakers and claims this material as her own. Terrell Du Johnson is a well-known Thana Otham, basket weaver in Arizona. His work reflects who he is, his culture, his family, and the desert. He has learned about tradition, patience, and techniques from his elders. In his work, he combines respect for tradition with his artistic vision, reflecting the world he lives in. 
He is part of an unusual collaboration with Aranda Lash Studio Architects, exploring algorithmic design with computer-aided technology. They share a foundation of pattern making in his experimental baskets. Johnson is engaged with a variety of materials, including grass, wood, glass, plastic, and metal. There's a continuum from the latest technology back through traditional weaving and basketry, looking back and moving forward. Terrell uses bear grass, vegetation from the Sonoran Desert. He always incorporates some kind of traditional material from his land in his work, and through the material keeps his ties to who he is. Terrell says that traditional designs were once experimental. He has the perspective of a long look at his culture. In his hands, the tradition is changing as it has in the past. He takes chances. Baskets come from his heart, expressing feelings and hope for the future. Here's a short video of Terrell creating his work which became a commission for the U.S. Embassy in Asuncion, Paraguay. Death Tugs, Live, I Am Coming. I took this title from an anonymous Roman poem. I cut and altered plant materials growing in my garden, painting it to suggest wrought iron. After a commission I had designing monumental gates cast in Tasmania for the Maui Arts and Cultural Center, I continued my interest in the translation of fiber to metal here I expressed a funerary reference in the carrying vessel. In Malignant, I used painted coconut palm midribs and inserted them into, but still protruding, from the netted form. A single shuttle hangs suspended, carrying more of the flexible netting element, but stopped short. I've created several sculptural baskets in cast bronze. This one is entitled Ordnance. On the island of Kaolave, there is unexploded ordnance from years of the US munitions testing and bombing exercises there. The island has been returned to native Hawaiians, but other than the cleaned up paths, there remains the fear and likelihood of unexploded ordnance. Lost in translation, 
also in cast bronze. This form has been cut through, reminiscent of the Jewish tradition of cutting or rending one's clothes as a tangible expression of grief and mourning, forever changed with loss and death. Gone, cast bronze with parts lost, burned out in the casting. Sara Lisa Latalo has chosen to look at the emptiness, the isolation and the silence left by grief. She writes, my work is looking at the very human experience of grief, mine as well as people I have met on this journey. I try to translate these myriads of emotions into visual form. I use paper as my primary material. Here I am using paper thread to make fishnet knots. Counting, Still Counting is an exhibition I had during the pandemic. More than a million people have died just in our country, more than six million worldwide. So much of the world we're living in and our response to it seems out of control. I envision being encircled by this long linear strip enclosed within, inside an architectural space, as if inside a basket, trying to take in what it means, what it has meant in our, in my time, and what we're still experiencing.
The artists whose work I've selected to show have responded to this world, their personal or public world, to the time we're living in, contributing to the vibrancy of the field. There are many others whose work I couldn't include. Their creative work, which speaks to me, expresses that human life is invested in baskets and that this is the space within which we, all of us, can imagine and express ideas and values. What we hold dear can shape what we have to say. Our world is a basket filtered through our imaginations within which we support each other to do our very best work as makers. Makers holding baskets. Thank you. Go. Hi, everyone. Here we are. Um, please put your questions in the Q&A. Um, and I think I'm going to start because when we did our practice, uh, I had a, a pertinent question for Pat. So what was your process coming up with this presentation, this lecture, how did you select the people to feature, the pieces to feature? Where did all of this come from? Well, I think I've been at this business quite a while. Um, in, the, in the talk, I mentioned that I had been so lucky to be at the University of California, Berkeley, when Ed Rosbach was writing his book, baskets as textile art and being a student of his and also just aware of, of baskets, um, thinking about them, beginning to photograph them, um, studying at the, at the then Lowy Museum of Anthropology to learn from the actual pieces. Um, I collaborated with Lillian Elliott, a colleague, a mentor, a dear friend for 11 years, and she was making baskets. And so whenever we went to exhibits, I was thinking about baskets. I was seeing baskets everywhere and studying with Joanne Siegel Branford even before that. She was also helping me see more about baskets. So I've been, I've been gathering slides as an idea file images that I look at and think about. Um, Carol Eckert, our past president in NBO, has this amazing daily offering of follow it with images of baskets so that every day some people get poems, I get baskets. <laughs> anyway, they seem to come to me. I've recently taken the course with Catherine Hunter, an online course on baskets, and she's helped me become more aware of contemporary native basket makers. So it's, a, it's an ongoing gathering and thinking about what baskets can do and what I hope my baskets can say. So when I had the opportunity with NBOs asking if I would do this closing lecture, I began to look at some of these idea images and, you know, slowly I began, it began to take shape. But anyway, it, I've had a few years of thinking about this. So anyway, it was a, it was a nice challenge and a, and a great opportunity. So thank you. Well, thank you so much. So here's a couple of questions. Um, somebody wants to know what kind of gut you used in counting. Yeah, I use sausage casings, hog casings, which I get from www.sausagemaker.com. They're based in Buffalo. And I sandwich the nails between um, 
layers of gut so that they are embedded in that long strip. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, Nancy Beth wants to know what's next for you. Ah, <laughs> a nice question. Um, just continuing to do my work in the studio, looking ahead to what can happen and what more I can. One always hopes my best work, I always hope my best work will be the next work. So um, let's see what happens. Yeah. Well, we have several thank yous um, from anonymous attendee. Wonder if you have any experience with Ligma yarn? No, none. I'd like to know about it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, and here's just a comment from April Stone. I have no questions, but wanted to say that she and her friend Kindred have enjoyed the presentation. They're sitting at her kitchen table weaving. What a wonderful way to spend an afternoon together. And thanks you. Um, let's see. Oh, so somebody wants to know, Sandra Miller, Love the presentation. She wonders if you might share the list of your text or share your text. I'm not quite sure. Um, Cause she couldn't understand the names of many artists. Hmm. Uh, and she's still resonating with our experience at Aramont. So I think you could probably take that offline with her maybe. Yeah, I, I'd be happy to do that, uh, Sandra. And um, I realized the recording, sometimes it sounded a little scratchy. And certainly the music that my friend, colleague, uh, Mark Atterbury um, had with the video at the end was not, not, did not do justice to what he had composed. And I'm not sure why that was, but that's what we have. Um, anyway, I'll be in touch with you, Sandra, about about names of people mentioned in this in this presentation. Yeah. Um, and Janine wants to know if you could name the artist who created the glass piece. Ah, uh, yeah. Hold on a minute. Candace, she's based in Portland. Um, she was a student of mine at Snow Farm. Her last name, hmm, I will have to, <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, I can't, that, that's just not coming immediately. Um, can you put that question in the in the in the chat or something so that I can send her send you her last name. Um, right. Okay. Yeah. It's Janine Anderson. So okay. If I can yeah. Get her um name. all right. Okay. And let's see what else we have here. More thank yous. Many thank yous. Um and somebody else also wants the list of artists that you shared. So maybe you can put that together and we'll include it someplace when the recording is up on the NBO website. Um, okay. I thought of Candace's last name. I think it's Candace Pratt. Okay. So, <laughs> yeah. And Marsha Moore says, aloha, dear Pat. Oh, aloha to you. Um, there's many thank yous. Okay, here's when working with materials such as paper or gut, do you need to do anything in regard to the environment where the pieces will be displayed humid versus dry? Um, <clears throat> when I when I order gut, it comes in um, it's packed in salt. And so it's really necessary to wash the salt out so that the salt doesn't draw, draw humidity from the air. So it's helpful to be in a gallery or a space where there is a dehumidifier just to make sure that it's not drawing more moisture. 
Um, but that's the only thing I do. I'm not coating the dried gut after afterwards with any protective surface. Yeah. All right. Um, Lisa Hunter says, thanks for introducing folks who are younger than us to these wonderful artists and friends, all the new. Um, yeah, they need to be worth right. thank yous. Oh, and here is June Kim from Japan saying from, hello to you. Oh, Jian. <laughs> well, Hi. yes. Yes. <laughs> That's great. Um, have you ever thought of putting your excellent presentation in a book? <laughs> <laughs> Take a deep breath. Um, no, actually. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thank you for the idea. We'll see what happens next. All right. Um, many thank yous. Many, many thank yous. Um, I'm not sure what that means. Um, anybody else have any questions? We've pretty much gone through what people have put in the list. Um, and if not, I will just go ahead. I'll give another minute or two. Um, Nancy Konigsberg also says, thanks so much. And many people are thanking you and, uh, and NBO for doing this for a second time because there's so much in this presentation that one viewing is not nearly enough. So I think with that, um, I'm going to thank everybody in the audience for joining us today, um, particularly I want to thank Pat for doing this a second time along with a second practice session. Um, it's a lot of work to put these on. The program was recorded and we will include the Q&A time in the final version. So a lot of this will show up. We're not quite sure when it will be up on the NBO YouTube channel and link, but it will, be announced, we'll put it up on social media, and then it'll be up on our website. I hope everyone enjoyed this program as much as I did. I think